good morning. Welcome to the well. Our church has been in the season of Advent, which is a time that's observed worldwide, really, by the church at large, in proceeding up to Christmas. And each week that we've gathered, we've sung different carols, we've done different things to lend light to how Advent is a time meant to be observed in so many great ways. Advent simply means arrival. And as we anticipate the arrival of Jesus, we hope that you see that anticipation and feel that anticipation that we all long for, no matter where we find ourselves this day, whether far or near from God, Jesus has come near to draw near to us. So each week we've been using a Advent wreath here. That is a tradition that's often observed in many churches and different expressions to mark the subsequent weeks leading up to Christmas. And each candle as we've lit every single week kind of represents the increasing light with which Christ has come into the world. So we've been having children come and participate and lead us a bit in our time here as we begin our services to light our Advent wreath and read a scripture that lends light to the nature with which Jesus has been prophesied from of old, that he has come before time even began to know and see us. So we're going to have Noel and Louise Hathorn come on up here, and they're going to read our opening Advent scripture and light our Advent wreath. So can we welcome them? Son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9 6. so good to see generations with us of all different ages worship, and it's truly the thing we remember a lot at this time of year as we sing carols and songs that have perhaps been passed to you all from generations before, and uh, remember that as you sing throughout the season that God has given us a responsibility, no matter what age we find ourselves in, particularly as adults, to pass on the faith for those who have come behind us. So we're going to sing one such carol today as we begin, Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silence, that we've been singing a bit. And uh, as we begin, would you all stand with us as I pray for us? We're going to pray a prayer as we begin today, as you see it on screen, before we sing. Would you pray this aloud unto God? Lord God Almighty, King of glory and love eternal, you are worthy at all times to receive adoration, praise, and blessing. We praise you now for sending your Son our Savior, Jesus Christ, for whom our hearts wait, and to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, be honor and dominion, now and forever. Amen. Amen to that. Let's sing together.
to you this day, would you remind us and would you make us to know your past? Lord, would you teach us your past? Would you lead us in truth and teach us? For you are the God of our salvation and for you we wait all the day long. Amen. You all can be seated as we continue to hear from the word of God. Well, good morning. How we doing? We doing good? All right, well, it's good to be with you here this morning. We're going to be in Matthew 2. If you want to go there in your Bible, that would be great. Is there any way to raise this up? Yeah, I'm going to raise it up. Yeah, that would be great. Gotcha. Thanks, man. Okay. Yeah, all right. <laughs> you want more? No, I think it should be fine. I could definitely go no, more. I can reach it. It's good. All right, dude. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. Yep. Yeah. Um, all right, if you want to go to Matthew 2, uh, we'll be there this morning. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite passages in the birth narrative of the Messiah. Um, I kind of have two favorite pa- types of passages in the Bible. One are texts that are really obscure and hard to understand. So like, give me some Malachi and Ezekiel. Those are really fun to preach on because they're often overlooked and unappreciated. The other ones are really popular but misunderstood. Uh, this text this morning is one of the latter. So you'll get like uh, passages in Philippians and other places. But we're going to be in uh, Matthew 2 talking about the wise men. And I'm going to tell you the big idea of this passage up front. The big idea in this passage, if you were to take notes, which I would recommend, is uh, Jesus is worthy of worship. And what we're going to see throughout this passage is how the wise men prove that to us, how God uses the wise men to prove that. Here's how I think about it in this passage particularly. When we're thinking of the wise men coming to visit and see the Messiah... There are things in life 
where when you encounter them for the first time, uh, you have no other response but to stand in awe or respond in a way of kind of almost disbelief, uh, like reality has been suspended. I remember when our first son was born, and really the first child has that impact more than the other ones. I mean, every child's a blessing, but the first one just really like shocks you as a father because it's like everything's changed. And just like that, um, you know, the, the woman has been pregnant for nine months, so she's been like really experiencing it. And then all of a sudden when the baby comes for the dude, it's like, oh, wow. Like, it's here. Like, things are radically different, and you kind of stand in awe of that reality. Something profound has just happened, and that's what we're going to see here in the, similar in, in this passage. So let's look at Matthew 2, 1 through 12. We're going to read that, and then we'll dive into it together. Matthew 2, 1 through 12 says this. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw a star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, or Judah, are by no means least of the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained that from them that what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. We're going to look at four different responses in this uh, passage, three responses, and really focusing on Jesus. We have, the, we have Herod, the wise men. And we have the, uh, the scribes um, in, in Jerusalem. So let's kind of set the stage, the context we're in for this passage. First of all, Jesus has already been born. Uh, so that kind of messes up some nativity scenes. Jesus has already been born. So they're living in a house. Um, we can see from the context that Jesus was a small child. So presumably he was under two. If we look at the subsequent passages, we see that Herod uh, puts out an edict, like Herod's line in this passage, we're going to get to that. But he puts out an edict for every child under two to be killed, right, in that region. And so presumably Jesus was between zero and two, okay? But he's not just a newborn at this time. And Mary and Joseph then end up fleeing because presumably Jesus would have fit the description of being a male child under two. So who are these wise men, or magi, as, as some texts say? Uh, all, all we get from this are that they are men from the east. So that means they came from outside of Israel, from the east. Okay. Now there's lots of uh, speculation on who these wise men could have been, where they could have come from. Some have said they're Zoroastrian priests. Some have said they're from Babylon or Persia. And that would really, that would really make sense from the biblical narrative. I mean, Jesus, or I'm sorry, God often uh, talks about Babylon and, and God's people are in Persia. And then you even have uh, Abraham and Genesis coming from the east to find the promised land. So there's definitely overlaps there. Uh, but all we can say is that these are not Israelites who are coming to worship Jesus. And really this gets to a, a thing I want to highlight throughout uh, the sermon this morning is that when you read the Advent story, when you read the New Testament in general, but specifically the, the birth story of Christ, you should always read it with the Old Testament open right beside it because we're constantly seeing glimpses back to and references back to and prophecies fulfilled in the Old Testament. The text does not indicate to us how many wise men they were. Presumably, they were able to travel. Uh, they were well-studied in astronomy. And so the best understanding is the, these were kind of rulers, wise men, magi from the east. They would have traveled in a caravan, probably had servants, cooks, a whole kind of uh, wagon train, if you will, of people that have come from the east to worship Jesus. And they're aware of the star that indicates a newborn king has come. And this is fascinating on many levels. Why? Because here we have people who are not God's people who are aware of the prophecies in the Old Testament. They've studied the stars. They're astrologists. Very, it would have been very popular in our town, right? 
Um, they would have been experts in astrology, dream interpretation. One commentator calls it secret arts. They were ex experts in secret arts. I don't know what that means. Sounds, sounds suspicious, but that's what they were. Uh, they probably had some familiarity with the Old Testament because they, uh, they knew the prophecies, they knew the star, they had some alignment there. They, they would have been curious about other religions, and so they were studying kind of the main texts of other religions as wise men from the East. That's what they did. They probably had in mind something like Numbers 23 and 24, where Balaam spoke a prophecy about a star to come, and so they, they would have known that. And so they're, they're putting together astrology in the Old Testament, and they're seeing that a newborn king has come. Now they're going around Jerusalem and they're asking a lot of people. They don't go specifically to Herod first. Uh, they just start asking people where the newborn king is. They assume that people would know about this, that God's people would know that a newborn king has come. And so they assume that, so they start asking and it actually causes quite a disturbance in the city, in the city because it says uh, when Herod heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. So even though the locals are very disturbed and when it says uh, troubled, that's, that's an understatement in the English. It's actually very terrified. They're very upset by this possibility. And so Herod catches wind of it. He becomes nervous, anxious, and we'll get to that in a second as, as to why. But he goes to who? The chief priest and the scribes. We see that in verse 4. These would have been religious leaders who knew the Torah, the Old Testament. They knew the prophecies about Jesus, and they're able to tell Herod exactly where the newborn king would come. Bethlehem. They knew. They knew exactly where Jesus was going to be. And yet, what were they doing? Absolutely nothing. Did not care. They were utterly disinterested in finding the Messiah. Instead, the people who had no connection to God's people, people were more interested in the Messiah than they were. Of all the people to care about the Messiah, we would think that the people who knew the scriptures would be the most excited. But they were not, they were terrified. There's gross ignorance amongst the people who should know this, and yet there's insight from the people who you would not think would know anything about Christ. How awful to know everything about the scriptures, but know nothing of Christ. Be totally disinterested in Christ. Too many are interested in the scriptures, but not interested in finding the Messiah himself. Because Christianity isn't about knowing the right Bible verse, it's about knowing the right person. And that person is none other than Jesus Christ, the newborn king. If you study the scriptures, if you memorize the Bible, but you miss Jesus, you have missed everything. And that's what these people have done. Consider further that it's these pagans looking to the stars, practicing astrology, who are most excited about this newborn king. These religious leaders, they're quite comfortable with the current establishment. The current regime is very kind to them, favorable. They get consulted by the king. Herod summons them, and, and can, they get to feel special and come into the king's court. They're very safe and secure in his kingdom. Uh, they're privileged. They have all sorts of privileges by going into, into the court. Um, he respects them. They live a comfortable life of Bible scholarship, where they've got their 401k and their, their kids' college funds saved up. They are not interested in a regime change. They're just totally disinterested in that. That sounds like it would disrupt what is, and they do not want that. And you've got a feel for them. I mean, they've got all the good things in life. They've got good things going for them. The problem isn't that they've got good things going for them, or even that they're in the king's court and they can be summoned by the king. Those aren't the problems. The problem is that those things have displaced faith in God for them. They've let the, the niceties of life, the good things of life, take the place of God. What does the arrival of these non-Israelites tell us? It tells us a couple things. One, Jesus is Lord of all people. Not a particular people, he is Lord of all people. And since it is so, it's appropriate that at the time of Jesus' birth, people from another country, from a distant Gentile land, would pay their homage. Furthermore, what we see in this passage is that the divine purposes of God cannot be overthrown and thwarted. God's purposes will always stand. Earthly kings like Herod may try to circumvent God's purposes and beat them down, but in the end, they're always defeated. Pay attention to this phrase that it calls Jesus. It calls Jesus a newborn king. This is the wise men declaring that Jesus is a newborn king. He isn't a possible king. He isn't someone who might pull a sword out of a stone and, and become king one day. He is born to be king. He is born king. He is the rightful king. He doesn't need to overthrow Herod because he's already king. He is rightful king of God's people just by being born. I think of it this way. Sometimes in war you have uh, kings in exile. 
there was a, the king of Norway during World War II, Haakon, I think I'm saying that right, but he had to flee and he fled to England. And he actually had what, what's called a government in exile in England. They set up in Buckingham Palace. And so they had the Norwegian government in exile with the king, the rightful king of Norway in Buckingham Palace running a government outside the country. But Haakon, the rightful king of Norway, was always the, the right king for Norway. He was of the lineage. He was a monarch. And we have a hard time understanding this as Americans because we elect democratically, right? And so we don't have this lineage thing in our story. But what happens in, in a government in exile is they flee, and the very fact that they exist, that this king still lives, Hakon in, in England, is a threat to the establishment or those who have taken over Norway. In a similar way with Jesus, when Jesus comes, he is an existential threat to any ruler. He is an existential threat to Herod. The arrival of Messiah is not just a threat to Herod, it's a threat to all people and all rulers who claim absolute authority. Christ has arrived. He is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. I want to press this analogy just a bit further. Uh, many treat the kingdom of God as if it's a government in exile. As is because Jesus has ascended, he lives today, and he's in a different place than we can see right now, that his rule is somehow thwarted, or it's not total, and in some way it's diminished, and he's a king in exile, and, and as if the kingdom of God is a government in exile, and that's not what we see in the Bible at all. And said in the Bible, what we hear from Jesus is all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to him. He has complete authority. Does that not mean that there's still rebellious factions in the world? No, not at all. We know that. But the reality is that King Jesus reigns today. All authority has been given to Jesus. The king reigns today. The kingdom of God is not a government in exile. King Jer Jesus currently reigns today. And here's, here's how this matters for us. This shapes how we evangelize. This shapes how we share the gospel. A lot of us, when we share the gospel, what we typically do is we, we pitch it as like an invitation to come and see. Uh, we we want to invite people to come to know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, right? And so we have this invitational spirit, which is great. Like, continue doing that. But what, what often happens is we, we present the gospel in a fairly feeble manner, as if Jesus doesn't reign. Instead, what the gospel literally in, in, in the New Testament, that word itself, is a declaration of lordship. It's a declaration of victory. Our gospel, when we share the good news with people that King Jesus is here, we are heralding good news to people. We are declaring reality over the world. We are declaring what is true about other people. So our, go our, our evangelism, our gospel presentations shouldn't be feeble. No, it is declarative of what is true about everything that Jesus is worthy of worship. That is what we're inviting people into. See, these wise men, they knew that Jesus is worth searching after. Jesus is worth traveling from your homeland and leaving behind what you know. Someone has come that is worthy of praise, worship, and adoration. And not just anyone, but the Messiah, the one long foretold, someone who is king, the rightful king of all. And this is the call to all people. To leave what you have, forsake your sins, repent and believe. Leave your homeland and come into the kingdom of Christ, an everlasting kingdom. Leave behind your sins and come to the Father. So this is the wise men. What about for Herod? What does this mean for Herod? We have these magi or wise men coming from the east to worship, to bring gifts, to worship this newborn king. What about Herod? You have to understand Herod's position here. Herod is a provincial ruler of the Roman government. He came in to bring order. Just a century before Herod, there was a revolt in Israel. It was that fascinating historical episode, uh, the Maccabean Revolt, um, where the Jewish people rose up and overthrew Greek power in Israel. It was very American. It was like their experience of an American revolution. It's a fascinating story. You've got a guy named Judas, uh, who was the leader, and his nickname was Maccabee, which ne means hammer. And so you've got the Hebrew hammers, and they come up against the Greek power, and they overthrow the Greeks, and they, they institute their ways. But eventually, it's suppressed. This revolution is suppressed, and uh, they're put back under uh, Roman rule and Roman power. So now the Romans have come in, and Herod has come in in the first century BC, and he's coming to squash out any remaining vestiges of revolution. 
So any kind of sign of Jewish uprising, Herod has been instituted to stop just that. And so for, for the idea for a newborn king to come would be exactly the problem he's there to solve, right? He is there to stop that from happening. He did not want another Hebrew hammer rising up in his midst. And Herod knows that Jesus is a threat. Herod is troubled that the king of the Jews has been born. He's supposed to squash rebellion. He's supposed to keep order. And he's more than just troubled, he's terrified. I don't think we understand and appreciate the seriousness of the threat that Herod faces. And you have to understand that the Messiah's birth is not just a threat to Herod, but it's a threat to everyone who opposes God. We typically think of the Messiah, the birth of Messiah in Christmas time as a gift, because it is absolutely a gift. It is a gift for all who will come and receive it, for those who have been called by God. But for those who do not, it is a threat. A new judge, a new king, a new ruler has been born. He is the living God, the judge of the world. Imagine, if you will, the threat that uh, we've explored in recent months in our nation, uh, the existential threat of like nuclear war, for example, right? And there's been a lot of rumors of that, as there are in every generation. But there's, there's, uh, there's kind of this feeling of like, at any moment, everything could end. That's kind of scary. Imagine, though, if we as, as a country did not have any means of deterrent or any nuclear arsenal, and we had no way to stop another country from decimating us and wiping us off the face of the planet. That would be scary, right? That would be really unnerving, especially because we as Americans are used to holding the big stick. That's not a place we're familiar with. This is the type of existential threat and fear that the birth of a Messiah would have had for Herod. And not just Herod, but for sin, Satan, and death. For unrepentant sinners included. What would you do in the, in the face of a threat like this? You would want to know where it is. So you could get rid of it. So you could get rid of it. We know Herod is li- lying to these wise men. Often people in power who are motivated by their own self-preservation will use and collude with religious leaders for their own purposes. We see this today on left and right and north and south, whatever political polarity you want to use. This happens all the time. And that's exactly what Herod does. He wants to find and use the religious leaders to eliminate the threat against his hegemony, against his power. See, Jesus came to make the world new, to recreate, and Jesus disrupts what is to recreate what should be. The arrival of the Messiah is like a new creation. Jesus comes as the second Adam to fulfill what the first Adam failed to do. The Messiah has come to disrupt what is and is coming to recreate and bring the kingdom of God. It is not merely a nice story. It is a true story of God's provision and promise to make things right. How can we trust God's goodness and justice? Because Christ has come and he will come again. So we have the wise men looking for Jesus. Herod's greatly troubled. Let's look at the response and the end. Well, the wise men are told where they can find this newborn king, the Messiah. It's Bethlehem. And they know this because of the prophecy, as we see in verse 6. This is a prophecy from Micah 5.2. And so the wise men traveled to Bethlehem, which is only like five miles from Jerusalem. It's really, I was trying to map it out for Boulder, for Boulder for our context, and it's like you wouldn't even get out of the city limits. So it's fairly close. I mean, most of y'all in Boulder can run five miles. I don't know if I can, but you can probably run five miles, right? So it's fairly close to where Jerusalem is. And the name Bethlehem is fascinating, and we shouldn't overlook this. The name Bethlehem means house of bread, And so it makes sense that Jesus would come from there. Why? Because he's the bread of life. The bread of life would come from the house of bread. He calls himself that over and over again. He says, we should eat the bread at the Lord's Supper, a meal of covenant renewal, because he is the bread of life who hails from the house of bread. He tells his followers that they will eat his body. And that turns a lot of people off, by the way. A lot of people leave him in John 6 over that. Why? Because he is the bread of life. When we're taking the Lord's Supper, we're not merely remembering We're not merely remembering. We are living out the teachings of Jesus Christ. We are feasting on him. He was placed in a manger, for goodness sakes. Why? Because he's the bread of life. It's a consistent theme. Jesus is worthy of all worship. He is life. Consider even what the the very gifts the wise men give to Jesus. We see the wise men, when they come to visit Jesus, they bring what? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And 
boy, if you want to have fun, you can look at what, what all that represents. Uh, lots, of, lots of church tradition about what those three gifts represent. But I want to connect something our church preached through Exodus this past year. And so I want to remind us of Exodus 30. What we see in Exodus 30 is you see the tabernacle. This is the meeting place of God. This is where God's people would meet with God. And we've got the anointing oil of the tabernacle is myrrh. We've got the incense in the tabernacle at frankincense. And we've got the tabernacle, tabernacle itself, the, the altars and everything in it, fitted with gold. The Bible is not incidental. And God is not incidental in his story of redemption. There are so many connections God has given us through history, through his word, that point to his plan of redemption. The wise men are giving these things that were used in the tabernacle because Jesus would be the tabernacle. He himself would be the place that people met with God. Christ himself is God with us. He would be gifted the things of the tabernacle to show that he himself would be the fulfillment of the tabernacle. So that we no longer need a temple or a tabernacle to go to, we have Christ. He is the tabernacle. He is the place of communion and connection with God. He is the one where the world is made right. He is the new Adam, the peak of creational restoration. He is the one that we need to go to, con to connect with God again. And just as the tabernacle was that place, so too Jesus is that person and he has constituted a body, his church, for you to experience connection with God, for you to be in communion with God. This is why throughout church history, it's not in the notes, this is why throughout church history, over and over again, if you read old dead dudes, particularly dudes, who wrote on theology, they constantly reinforced the church, the church, the church, and they would say things that would really upset most of us. They would say things like, there is no salvation outside the church. And we as evangelicals would, would go like, oh, no, 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 it's Jesus. Yes, of course, but the church is the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. And over and over and over again throughout the ages, this is what Christians have believed, that it is in the church that we find communion with God because Christ dwells with his people and his people are the church. Look at the difference between the wise men and Herod, the two responses, very visceral responses. The wise men worshiped Jesus. They were not terrified and undone like Herod. They were, in fact, jubilant. In fact, the English has a really hard time capturing. Uh, it's like five words. Rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. All to capture this expression that they were overcome with gladness. They were worshipful when they found Jesus. This is the stark difference between those who know Jesus Christ and those who do not. Those who know Jesus as Savior, Christ as Savior, know that the only response we have is jubilance, joy, and worship. Those who do not know Jesus hate him. They hate the authority he claims and what he stands for and what he's accomplished. And the best way many people can get rid of Jesus is to kind of sequester him into the category of a good moral teacher like Gandhi. That is not at all what Jesus claimed to be. And that is not at all who Jesus is. He is king of kings. He will be worshipped. The wise men don't treat him like some earthly ruler. They bow and worship. And look at what happens next. In a dream, in verse 12, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So these wise men would have been skilled in dream interpretation. They have a dream and they interpret the dream. And then they practice a little bit of civil disobedience and leave. And they don't go back to Herod, because they know. Now, whether it was an angel or not, whatever it was, there was a dream that was given to these wise men. Just as Daniel in the Old Testament was given dreams of judgment, dreams of, of the Messiah, dreams of what is to come, dreams of a, of a ruler who would come, so too in the Advent story we have dreams often happen to talk about the Messiah. Dreams again, dreams of this Messiah who comes in power, authority, and judgment. The King of Kings who is worthy of worship. But why do the wise men worship? The wise men don't worship Christ based on anything he has done other than be born. Why? Because he is worthy of worship. Full stop. He is worthy of worship. He is the fulfillment of the promises. He is the Messiah. He is the newborn King. 
Because with Jesus being sent into the world, the world has begun to be recreated. It is a new exodus. God's work of redemption has begun in earnest. We are no longer obligated to relate to God in the same way as in the Old Testament. Prior to Christ, salvation always has come through faith in God. But prior to Christ, there was a system of sacrifices in order to get rid of our sin and guilt on a regular basis. But with Christ, the newborn king has done away with that old system, and he himself has become our sacrifice of atonement, a once and final sacrifice for all time. No longer having to do a, a penance to prove anything or to make sacrifices in order to prove your worthiness to be saved. It is all on Jesus Christ. It is he who saves. If those who claim to belong to Christ, who know the Bible, who follow the scriptures, refuse to worship Christ, then God has no problem using pagans to worship him. The problem for the scribes and Pharisees isn't that they knew the Bible or even that they enjoyed the benefits of their life, which are good things, by the way. It's that they had forgotten and refused to see Jesus for who he is, the Messiah. And that's why he's worthy of worship. Friends, we started a, a church in Boulder for this very reason. The worship of Jesus Christ. That's it. This is the journey many must take to Jesus. They must leave their pagan land and go in search of the Messiah. They may even hear it from people that may be kind of nominally Christian, maybe know the Bible. But in order to worship the living God, they have to be told the truth about God. They have to hear from God. If you're looking for a Christmas that is simply nice and nostalgic with all the trinkets and traditions of the world, then Christ's birth is not for you. In fact, it directly confronts your comfortability with the normal ways of the world. The newborn king wasn't born to be placed on your mantle. He was born to be worshipped. That is the only legitimate response this Christmas to the news that the pagans knew, but God's people didn't. That Jesus Christ, the king, has come. He currently rules, and he's coming again. And Jesus is worthy of worship. We worship because Jesus Christ is worthy of worship. He is worthy of all honor and praise. The thing that you need this Christmas is Christ. It is his day. It's literally why it's called Christmas. It's Christ Mass, because Catholics have the Mass at Christ's birth. Christ Mass. That's what we have. It's all about Jesus. It's all about him. Christ has come. We worship the living God. We praise the one who has come and will come again. He rules today and his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. He is the fulfillment of the promises and prophecies of God. He is remaking the world, giving new life, saving, giving new birth to people, securing those who belong to him, who he has been appointed to save, and he will surely save. He will surely see through your salvation. There is great assurance in Christ in his final sacrifice on the cross, but even in his birth, it is an assurance that we belong to him. He is our king. The call for us is to leave our homeland like the wise men, to journey to the kingdom of God by putting your faith in Christ because Jesus is worthy of worship. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you for your providence this morning and giving us your word from which we can be equipped for every good work. We pray for your Holy Spirit to convict us, to shape us, and to lead us into all truth and righteousness that we may live holy lives before you, that we may honor you with all of our thoughts, our deeds, our affections, our desires. Father, I pray that where we are not aligned with that truth, God, that we would have repentant hearts, that you would convict us this morning from your word, where we, where we ourselves are not enthralled by you, Jesus, I pray that you would act, that you would work in my life and our lives so that we could worship you rightly that you would stir our affections, our desires for you, that we would behave in accordance with your word, and that we would worship you in all of life. And for those in here who are traveling from a distant land, who, like the wise men, want to know more about this newborn king, I pray this morning, God, that you would give new life. God, I pray that they would find new life in you, Jesus, that they would worship you. And I pray for our church, the Well Church, that we would be a church that doesn't just focus on the scriptures for the sake of knowing the scriptures, but that we would be focused on you, Jesus, that we would see you everywhere in the Bible, and that we would proclaim your lordship over all creation, 
that we would share this good news this Christmas season with anyone we can, and that we would not make feeble evangelistic efforts, but we would make bold proclamations about your lordship and your glory and the kingdom to come, and the fact that the kingdom has come. God, thank you for this church. I pray that we would worship you and delight in you this day. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue in song and sing O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Some of you may know this song from a bit ago in your childhood, but what I always love about it is how it speaks directly scripturally to a very name by which Jesus is called throughout all the Old Testament, by which he fulfills in and of himself. Emmanuel just means God with us. And each time we sing this carol, I'm reminded of that, how Jesus has come to destroy all preconceptions of what it means to be God with us. He comes to fulfill it so that no other false God that has come before him or after him will be able to. Amen. So let's sing that together. We stand together. Let's sing.
proved himself to be worthy of all praise. We're going to sing a lot about that in the moments coming after this. And one song we're going to sing, the first Noel, speaks to much of that nature with which Jesus is the only one who could claim to be born of God. Amen. Noel means that in French, born of God. And so I hope as you sing that today and as you sing what we're about to sing, that you might remember that Jesus alone can claim that. And because he can claim that, he can atone for our sins. He lived a perfect, sinless life. And so each time that we gather, we can confess freely the ways with which we have not lived a perfect life. For those of us who find ourselves in Christ, Christ has come that he might meet us in our imperfection and provide us with himself and feed us with himself when we feel at a loss, when we come into this space each week to worship him. I want you all to hear from Psalm 85. As Kim reads this, there's a beautiful picture we see of how Jesus marries the perfect marriage of righteousness and justice and offers it to us in and of himself. We're going to pray from there as we hear this from Psalm 85. Hear this. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. The glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground and righteousness looks down from the sky. As we sit in that for a moment, would you pray this prayer on screen aloud unto God as we ask for him to meet us in the weakest parts of us that are sinful and in suffering. Almighty God, you who called forth light, forgive us for keeping company with the dark at times. You who sent John to be a voice to crying good news, forgive our unwillingness to say anything at all. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we come to this time of communion, having confessed our sins and assured ourselves of salvation, as Pastor Matt comes forward, would you take up your elements in communion for those of you who are in Christ? Each week at the well, we take communion. And as Chase brought up in his sermon, it's not just remembrance. That is a key component, is it not, right? That we remember the sacrifice of Christ. We remember that our sins have been forgiven. We remember all those things in, in a regular meal to remind us of, is a great thing. But it's also a covenant renewal. It's a reminder of, uh, of what Christ has accomplished and the renewal that we have in being found in him and also being with one another. It's a meal that we take together physically as a church and that's why it's so important and so with that said um if you have your elements if you're a christian if you follow christ if you claim his lord um you can participate in communion with me and you can go ahead and peel back the layer that reveals the bread this bread represents the body of christ which was broken for you take and eat you can turn it over and you have the wine or juice on the other side This wine represents the blood of Christ that was shed for you. Take and drink. Amen. Amen. Um, also, during this time, we would encourage you to um, be prayerful and think about how, you, how God has been generous to you and how you can be generous to your church and to this church specifically, the well. And so we invite you to give during this time. We don't pass a basket, but we have a kiosk right over by the coffee bar where you can give at or a box where you can drop a check. 
or as always, you can give online at boulderwell.org slash give. And so um, we would just encourage you as the year rounds out to be as generous as you can with your church. And so um, it's a huge blessing to us, and um, you guys have already been so generous this year. It's amazing. And so let's just finish the year off strong, and we're so thankful for you all. With all that said, let's continue our time of worship through song.
is our prayer, Lord Jesus, as we come to you and sing to you that you have been born of God, that you are worthy of all praise and adoration, that you alone are King of kings and Lord of lords. We worship you this day for it as we go. Amen. Let's sing. Your carol strong. You guys can have a seat. We got some announcements for you as you go. Hey, before you head out, just a couple quick announcements and a benediction. Um, 
One, you're wondering why I'm holding this mug. One, it's for, it, this is a gift for you if you uh, fill out that Connect card that's on your table. So if you're new, um, we'd love a chance to meet you um, via that way, pray for you. Um, we'll just follow up with you and see how we can help you connect here. And if you drop that off at the table right over there, you get one of these. They're pretty nice looking. I will warn you, don't put them in the dishwasher. The cork on the bottom, I learned the hard way, it's not good. Hand wash only. But they're really nice, so, so come and grab one when you drop off that card. Um, also on there, you can, um, if, you, if you want to just drop it off for prayer, you can always do that. And as always, we have our prayer team in the back that's um, here to pray with you after the service if you'd like to pray with somebody in person. Um, also coming up, make sure you know about this, we have our Christmas Eve service um, coming up. It'll be right here December 24th, that's Christmas Eve, um, at 4.30 p.m. 4.30 p.m. candlelight service right here. It's a great thing to invite people to. If you're in town, I would encourage you not just to stay home on Christmas Eve, but to come and worship. It's, it's, it's one of my favorite services of the year, and as a preacher, it's actually one of the easiest services to preach because everybody knows what it's about. And so it's, it's a great time, so um, I'll, I'll be preaching that night. So I hope to see you there December 24th. Forth. And as if one day of church on a weekend isn't enough, we got a second one for you on Christmas Day. We will be having service. People are like, you're having church on Christmas Day? I'm like, it's called Christmas. Yes, um, we are a Christian church and we will be having church on Sunday because that's what we do, right? And we will have communion and, and a Christmas Day sermon. It's going to be light. It's going to be fun. Um, I'm planning on bringing the kids up on the stage and doing something where I'm sure we'll break something. It's going to be great. You don't want to miss that. And so it'll be a great time. So if you're in town, Christmas Day, we did it in the afternoon so you can uh, have your Christmas morning. But I don't know about you, but by three o'clock, I'm like ready to get out of the house. So come to church. That's a great time and, and, and be here on Christmas Day. Um, also, uh, we want to make sure that you um, have been looped in on year-end giving. This is a big time for all churches, but for our church specifically this year, as we are, um, we are in the final phases of the permit process. Um, Chase, I've been texting with our builder, and so hopefully in the next month or so, ish, um, we, we should start actual construction on our building. So you'll be able to see that. So, um, so hopefully, hopefully, Lord willing. Um, I've learned with the city of Boulder, Lord willing. Uh, and so he is king. He rules over everything. And he will get that permit through, I believe, in faith, right? And so, um, and so we're going to be moving forward in that. But um, just to, to spur you on, this is an important time for us as a church as we go into this new year of doing this build out in this building and uh, in, in our home and all that um, the church is doing. Um, launching Tanner, our new church plant in the Vale Valley, all of those sorts of things that are going on. Um, we need your partnership um, this month to wrap up the year well. So if you're able to do that, um, we'd encourage you to be generous at the end of the year here. Um, and then also, right after the service here today, um, if you're new and you've been here, maybe you've turned in a Connect card, and you want to know kind of more next steps here at the well, um, Derek will be right over here at the Connect area, um, and Derek will be there to receive you. And, and it's just a couple minute long class, um, not even really a class, it's more of a conversation about our church, how to get connected, areas of service, all of those good things. And so if you're interested in that, cruise right over to the Connect area after the service and uh, meet Derek for, for that. All right, let me read this benediction over you and send you on your way. It comes from Psalm 72, verses 18 and 19. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Hey, guys, go in peace. We love you. We'll see you back here on Christmas Eve. <laughs>